Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to the CMI School of Christ. And we're going to go ahead and continue with our class, The Great Mercy of God. And forgive me, uh, I can't remember when the last class we had was. Uh, I've kind of been like in a whirlwind since I got back from Mexico on that uh, Bible conference down at the at, down at the Bible school. So, uh, as I said, I'm just right now just catching up. <laughs> but <clears throat> I do want to go ahead and just continue uh, with with our class, the great mercy of God, and there were specific some specific specific verses that I did want to go over. And there, they are found uh, in, wow, it didn't, well, I'll have to type them all in. It didn't keep, store them in memory. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've just been thinking about these two verses. Now, I know that we've been uh, in Genesis chapter 15, verses 9 and 10 for I don't know how many weeks now. Uh, but I feel like going back and just looking at two verses in Genesis chapter 15, it's basically verse 5 and verse 7. And I know I've covered this uh, to some degree, but there's just, just something of the Lord stirring my heart uh, concerning these two verses. And I think that, I think we lose sight of, of, well, I think we lose sight of the Lord. That's basically what I wanted to say. It's not so, so much that we lose sight of things or of, of the Scripture or things in the Scripture. No, what happens is, 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 is that we lose sight of the Lord Himself. And... You know, we place it on, on instantly. I know that in your mind you can be thinking, "Oh yeah, well I know what he's talking about. He's talking about, you know, those things that are that are not good that believers should avoid, or this or that, or uh, sin or whatever." And that's not really what I mean. Well, that can be included, but what I'll, I'll just I'll just give this example. We as born again believers we can get so caught up in the things of God instead of Christ Jesus, the Son of God Himself. And that is exactly what I mean by when I say that we lose sight of the Lord Himself. We get so caught up with things, caught up with studies, caught up with reading, caught up with this or that. And I'm not, please listen, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that reading the scripture, studying the scripture is bad. No, no, no. I do that. I do that. I mean, this is based off of reading and studying and searching. So is this, this whole notebook right here of notes based on reading, searching, and studying. But what I'm saying is that we can lose sight of the Lord Himself in the midst of everything else. And <clears throat> with, with the Lord, with God, it's very simple. All things are to work together for the good. And the good is when our heart turns by the work of the Holy Spirit to behold the face of Jesus Christ himself. That is the good. It is beholding the Son of the living God. That is the good. In fact, that is the only good there is. So, all these things work together for that end. Everything that is of God, everything that is given of God, everything, everything that is allowed of God, everything that is uh, permitted of God, it is to serve that one end, that one purpose. 
that our hearts may turn and behold him who is in the midst. Him being Christ, the Son of the living God, who is in the midst of the soul. All right. <clears throat> now, the two verses that I've been looking at are Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 and verse 7. And what I want to do is just go ahead, before I get into it, just go ahead and read verse 7 first, because uh, ultimately this, this, is, this, is, this is the order of it. There is the reality that comes to the soul at the moment of new birth, that, or shall I put it this way, that the soul enters into at the moment of new birth. And then there is the understanding of the reality that has come to the soul. All right, and I'm not saying reality like uh, a message or a concept or a doctrine or a teaching. No, 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 no. I mean the reality of God who is Christ himself, the son of the living God. All right, before the soul is born again, Christ is not present. At the moment of new birth, Christ appears in the soul. He appears in his fullness, in his increase. He appears as the glorified Son of God. He appears in the soul. But as I've shared before, the born-again believer is completely ignorant of the one who's present. And the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that that is a sin. No, it's not a sin to be ignorant. But listen, it is not good to remain ignorant. Remember, once again, good. What is good? Good is when we are beholding the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a miracle of God, all right? So <clears throat> there is reality that comes to the soul at the moment of new birth because Christ himself appears in the soul, all right? He appears where he was not before. Now he is present in the soul. He is in the soul. He fills the soul with himself. Now there must be the understanding of the one who is present the understanding of the reality that the soul has come unto at the moment of new birth. And once again, the reality that the, soul, that the soul has come unto is a person. Because I've said it this way, and this, this may be better. The Holy Spirit, before the soul is born again, before the soul receives salvation, the Holy Spirit is working and preparing the ground of the heart, preparing the ground of the soul so that it may be born again, all right? So that the heart may turn unto the Lord that Christ may appear. At that moment, what happens at the moment of new birth, Christ, well, the moment of new birth is when, is when Christ appears in the soul. That is the moment of new birth, all right? Now, because Christ is in the soul, the soul is now in salvation, in life. Before the soul was, was in death, because Christ was not present. But now because Christ is present in the soul, now the soul is found in life, because life is present in the soul. All right? The Holy Spirit, by the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has brought the soul unto Christ, has brought the soul unto salvation, has brought the soul unto eternal life, all right? From that moment, from that moment on, the Holy Spirit does not change what he does. He does not start, okay, now we've done that, now we're going to do this other. No, 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 no. No, he continues working the very exact same way, preparing the ground of our heart, preparing the ground of our soul, so that our heart may turn yet again, that our heart may turn the second. Now, it is not so that Christ may appear, per se, 
uh, because he's already there. All right? But it is so that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God may appear. And that is found in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay? So then, from the moment of new birth, the Holy Spirit is continue, con continues preparing the ground of the heart, preparing the ground of the soul for this very thing, to bring the heart of the one who's born again, to bring the heart in understanding from the understanding of man unto the understanding of God. All right? Because he does this by preparing the ground of the soul, the ground of the heart and the ground of the soul, to bring, once again, to bring the heart in understanding, listen, unto where he has already brought the soul in reality. And I don't know of a better way of saying that. That is the best way that I can say it. That is the best way that I've heard it uh, said. And that is the work of the Spirit of God, continually bringing the heart after the, for, for the one who's born again, now that the soul is born again, now bringing the heart in understanding unto where he has brought the soul in reality. All right? And it is always the same. Listen to this. The Holy Spirit is always bringing the soul, the heart, unto Christ. First, unto where the soul was not before, then unto where the soul has been brought. But now it is in understanding, okay? That is the big difference. It is in understanding. And see, this is why, this is why uh, for so many ages and so many centuries, you have different believers with different understandings and different interpretations of the Scripture. This is why uh, here we are in 2016, all right? You have different fellowships, different, listen, denominations that hold true to their beliefs because they believe certain things according to the Scripture, and yet the Holy Spirit is still working faithfully to bring the heart in understanding unto where he's already brought the soul in reality unto the person of Christ. All right? And see, you can, you can look at the same. L listen to this. I, I, I know you'll understand this. Look at the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four Gospels. And I, I will say this, and you may already know this, you may have known this for a very long time, but when I was first born again at the age of 20, I began reading the Scriptures, and what I began reading first were the Gospels. The very first book that I read was the, the Gospel of Luke, all right? And then, so I read that, and I thought, well, I guess I'll read this other book from the beginning or the New Testament. I, I thought, well, I guess I should continue in the New Testament, but I'll just read it from the beginning. So I read Matthew and Mark. And I can't remember if it was at some point in, in Matthew or at some point in Mark that it, it just dawned on me. It hit me. It's like, these books are saying the same thing. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And as I continued to read the four Gospels, they were saying the same thing. It was the same stories. See, I don't, I don't know if that means anything to you, but that meant a world to me. Because remember, before I was born again, this is me personally, before I was born again, I didn't read the Scriptures. I had no clue. I mean, I, went, I would go to Sunday service on... Christmas, or maybe it was the night before Christmas, I can't remember, and on Easter. Those were the two requirements. You have to go at least these two days, and then you're covered for the whole year. That's the way I was brought up, all right? But at the moment, when, when I was born again, at the moment of new birth, I wanted to know. And see, that desire was never there before. 
But that desire was now there because, a lot, because of a life that was present and that is present and that continues to be present in my soul. Okay, so when I, when I read the four Gospels, it was a complete surprise to me to find out that they were saying the same thing. And see, these that were saying the same thing were declaring the same one. Now, I think it was uh, Mark that, that received the story of Jesus from Peter. And forgive me if I'm getting this a little wrong. If, if, I, if I got this wrong, it's been a while since I've been in Bible school. <laughs> Terrible, like we had a bad memory. Uh, and I think uh, Luke, Luke was something similar like that. All right, Matthew was a disciple and uh, John was a disciple. And I'm not sure about Mark and Luke. Maybe Mark was a disciple. Forgive me, I can't, like I said, there's several Marks in the Bible. And um, I may be getting it wrong, but uh, forgive me if I am. But the thing is, they were either, listen to this, they were either eyewitnesses themselves declaring what they had seen of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Matthew and John, or they were receiving and writing down someone else's testimony of what they had seen of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Do you see what I mean? So then you read the Gospels and you read one account well, I'll just give this example. Let's just, uh, the example with Lazarus, okay? And in one of the Gospels, it says, let me see, maybe I can be able to pull this up real quick. Or excuse me, it wasn't Lazarus, but uh, Bartimaeus. That's what it was. And I... Can't spell that. <laughs> Maybe I should get rid of the phrase. Maybe that'll help. Nope. I know how to find it. Forgive me, it's taking a while here. Uh, yeah, let's look at this. Let's see, a harmony, oh. oh. It's not quite how I thought it would be. I don't, oh. well, I don't know why. All right, I think this is the same uh, account. It's, it says it's a harmony, but I don't see the rest of the verses. And I'm, sp I'm, I'm actually learning how to use this actual harmony thing uh, right here in this Bible app. I've used the Bible app before. Uh, but this is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 24 through 34. Well, verse 27, excuse me, Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 through 34, verse 27. And when Jesus departed, Thence two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And he was, uh, and when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him and said, saith unto them, or, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then he touched, then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that thou, uh, see that no man know it. But they, when they departed, spread abroad his fame in all the country. And they went out, and they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. Okay, so it goes on. 
But right there, there's an account of two men coming to Jesus saying, Thou Son of Man, have mercy on us, okay? And ha, there we go. Here's, here's blind Bartimaeus. We've picked it up this time. Yep, it's, it's, it's when I went to uh, Mark chapter 10. All right, here is the harmony right here. You have Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 through 34, which we read uh, a portion of. Here you have Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, and you have Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Now, we read the account in Matthew. Now let's read the account in Mark. This is chapter 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he, care, he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded to him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made, hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Okay, Matthew describes two blind men. Mark describes one blind man. And let's just go ahead uh, and read Luke. This is Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through, through 43. And it came to pass that as he was coming nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I, might, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Okay? Here you have three different Gospels based on, listen to this, three different eyewitnesses beholding the same one, Christ himself, doing a miracle, okay? Giving sight unto the blind, all right? And yet these three same Gospels are declaring the same one. And that is the difference. That is the difference. You, if, I'll put it this way. If Matthew would have, would have started his own fellowship in such and such place, if Mark would have started his own fellowship in such and such place, and if Luke over here would have started his own fellowship in such and such place, they would still be declaring the same Christ. They would not be declaring anything different. They wouldn't be declaring different things. So then let's say those in, in Matthew's fellowship uh, for whatever reason, they had to move because economic reasons, so they move over to Mark's fellowship, right? And guess what they're going to hear in Mark's fellowship? The exact same thing they were hearing in Matthew's fellowship. Or what if this other uh, situation, here's some in uh, Luke's fellowship, and they, they, they can't 
live there anymore, and so then they move over to Matthew's fellowship, which is, let's say, 100 miles away. What do you think they will be hearing? They will be hearing the exact same thing. Why? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John declared, wrote their gospel, either based on being an, a personal eyewitness or receiving testimony of a personal eyewitness. Do you see? If we are beholding the same one, we will all be declaring the same one. We will all be giving the same testimony. Yes, their testimony was a little different. Yes, yes it was. But it all revolves around the same one. The emphasis is upon the one. And listen, even with blind Bartimaeus, even with, with this that's being declared, when the heart turns unto the Lord for the very first time, Christ appears in the soul. That soul has everything it will ever receive from God in the person of his son. Now, the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned, as I said before, as I said earlier, the Holy Spirit continues doing what he does, preparing the ground of the heart, the ground of the soul, so that the heart may now come, listen, in understanding, from the understanding that governs, from the understanding of man that governs it, unto the understanding of God. For what purpose? to behold the one who is present. And I love the way uh, Luke said it. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Do you see? The end result is always the same. To behold the one in the midst and God is glorified. Thank you, God. You have done what I could not do. You have done what man could not do. And God is glorified. Do you see? Now, as I was stating, back to 2016, the year 2016, why do we have so many different denominations declaring so many different things? Because unlike Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joseph, Abraham, because we're, we've been in Genesis. Who else? David, Solomon. Who, who else? Timothy. Who else? Stephen. Zechariah, Habakkuk, who else? The, the list, take every single person in the scripture that had the testimony of Christ. The reason why we have had, the reason why we have, and the reason why we will continue to have so many different denominations is because unlike those with a true testimony in the scripture, we are not beholding the same one they beheld. Don't get upset. This is the very purpose for which our souls were created of God, to behold Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, this is the very purpose for which our souls were created of God. For the soul that is not born again, there is no capacity to behold Christ. Therefore, there is no capacity to know Christ. How can you behold, how can you look upon one who is not 
present. It is impossible. Therefore, there is no ongoing knowing of that person. There is no ongoing relationship with that person except they be present. So then, you must be born again. All right? Now you are born again. By the work of the Holy Spirit, a miracle of God, the Spirit of God has caused the heart to turn unto the Lord, and Christ has appeared in the soul. At that moment, or that is the moment of new birth, Christ is present in the soul. All right? Now, now the capacity to know Christ the Son of the living God, is present. Remember, I think it was during this class, if not this series, uh, it, was a, it was a different series, but remember when we, when we looked at different uh, verses out of the Gospels, and basically it comes down to this, the purpose for those who are in the house and for those who come into the house is, is to behold the light of the house. Jesus said it. And see, the light of the house is not like a light bulb shining off of the ceiling or on a table lamp. No. The light of the house of God is Christ himself. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The light, listen to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. The light of the glory of God. How does it go? But God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath commanded, um, well, I'll just go ahead and read the verse because I know I'm not quoting it correctly. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge, there we go, from the understanding of man to the understanding of God, from the knowledge of man, what man knows, to the knowledge of God, what God knows, or more specifically and more perfectly, who God knows to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, nowhere else. Okay, so once again, for a soul to come to behold Christ, the Son of the living God, there must be the capacity. So that soul must be born again, but the soul is born again with purpose. And once again, that purpose is to behold Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, for there to be the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of the Son of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Did you like that better? The knowledge, listen, of the righteousness of God in the face of Jesus Christ, or I can say this, in the person of Jesus Christ the knowledge of the love of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of the peace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul, who was not involved in a message or a doctrine or a teaching. He was involved in knowing a person, remember? in the book of Philippians, that I may know him. Because what he encountered on the road while he was on his way to persecute the church was not a message from God. It was not a teaching from God, and it was not a doctrine or sermon from God. He encountered the Son of the living God himself. He encountered a person, and we are too. 
and we are to continue to behold this person from that very first encounter. And that very first encounter is the moment of new birth. Okay, <clears throat> so once again, uh, the four Gospels, all declaring the same one, having the same testimony because they are beholding the same one. All they are doing is serving the purpose of the Lord in their generation. And please do not think that it was by writing down so we could have a gospel. No, 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 no. They were serving the purpose of the Lord in their generation because they continued beholding the Son of the living God, and that is serving the purpose of the Lord in a generation. Therefore, they just declared what they were beholding out from beholding a person, all right? So now, let us go back to Genesis chapter five, excuse me, chapter 15. Let's read verse five. And at, at, at Genesis chapter 15, the Lord has already appeared to Abram several times, all right? He first appears to Abram when he is Ur, in, while he's in uh, Mesopotamia, Ur of the Chaldees. We read that in Acts chapter seven, verses like one through four. We can read it again in a second, maybe. Uh, Stephen is declaring men, brethren, fathers, high priest, anyone else who's present, all those who are present. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And let's just go ahead and read that since I mentioned it. Acts chapter 7, the book of Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 1. Then said the high priest, Are these, these things so? And Stephen said, Men, brethren, and, fa fa and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Quran. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. The God of glory appears with purpose. He didn't just appear to appear. He appears with purpose. New birth once again. New birth is with purpose. And come unto a land I will show thee. And once again, Galatians chapter 1. Yes, chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. But when it ple okay, look at this, look at this. This is the Apostle Paul declaring the gospel he declares. He's declaring how he came about declaring this good news, this gospel, this gospel, this eternal gospel of God. Verse, verse 11 of Galatians chapter 1. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For example, or in context concerning it, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. So he is saying, what I am declaring, I did not get from the knowledge of man, from man's knowledge, from man's understanding. Man did not impart this to me. I did not study it in someone's book. I did not study this in someone's sermon outline. I did not study this in someone's best-selling Christian book of the year. But by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here, my brother and sister, we have an eyewitness, a true eyewitness, an eyewitness of the resurrection. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, 
and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But, verse 15, but, I was going on my merry way, but, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, how did he do that? The moment of new birth. But, when the God of glory appeared, I was immediately separated from my mother's womb. And called me by his grace, and come unto a land that I will show thee, to reveal, verse 16, to reveal his son in me. Now remember, the land that God shows is the land that is filled with his very own glory. Remember with Abram, when Abram finally came into the land of Canaan, what was it that Abram found? He found the Lord, because the verse says, and the Lord appeared. The Lord was already in the land. Abram's heart just had to turn to behold the one who was present. Abram had to literally make a physical journey from Ur to Haran, from Haran, Quran, Charan, however you want to pronounce it, from Haran to Canaan. The believer doesn't have to make a physical journey. All that has to happen is that the heart must turn unto the Lord. But it is with purpose to behold the one who is in the midst. And then right here at the, at the very last part of uh, Galatians 1.16, the automatic of Christ being revealed, the automatic of a true witness of the resurrection. I preach him among the, the heathen. I declare him. And see, that's the thing. We are so caught up with wanting to preach something, wanting to declare something, wanting to teach something, and we've not even seen the Lord. We are not even a true eyewitness of the resurrection, who Christ himself is. The goal is, please listen and do not misunderstand and do not get upset. The goal is not to preach. The goal is not to teach. The goal is not to have a sermon. The goal is not to write a book. The goal isn't even to tape a video. The goal is to behold Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the very purpose for which God created the soul. Before before one who is born again, or how shall I put it? If, if, if one who is born again waited and waited until God revealed his son in their soul, if every single born again would just wait for the appearing of the Lord, I'll put it this way, if every single soul ever created just waited for the appearing of the Lord, first at the moment of new birth, and then the second as the knowledge, the light of the knowledge of the one who's present, if, 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 if we could just wait for the appearing of the Lord, then, please listen, my brothers and sisters, we would all be declaring the same one. We would all be a true witness, a true eyewitness of the resurrection. And then it didn't matter where a believer would fellowship 
in whatever fellowship, you know, if he had to move, fine. If he stayed or if, he, if things got changed up, if a, if, a, if a physical pastor died and a new pastor had to come and share with the flock, you know, it wouldn't matter between fellowships because all fellowships would be declaring the same one. But as it stands today, the year 2016, all fellowships do not declare the same one. They do not have a, well, how shall we say it? A, uh, no, I can't even think of the word. A continuous testimony, shall I say? How shall I say it? It's, it's, forgive me, I'm just, I'm just thinking about like a court of law and you have all these supposed eyewitnesses and all their testimonies are not matching up. <laughs> you know, one says one thing, another one says something completely different and this one over here says something completely different and finally the judge says, you know what, I'm going to toss this case out because nobody saw anything. There is only a consistent testimony when there is a consistent beholding of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, my brothers and sisters, is a miracle of God. When God reveals His Son in the soul that is born again. And this is the very purpose for which God created our soul. Back to Genesis chapter 15, starting with verse 5, because it's in order of verses, but we're going to see the order declaring the reality is actually starts with verse 7. But verse 5, And the Lord brought Abram forth abroad. And what we've said, uh, we've looked at that, excuse me, that verse before we looked at, looked at that passage, and basically what's happening? The Lord is bringing Abram out. Out from where? Out from his heart, abiding on the earth, abiding, listen, in the natural realm, in the realm of natural sight, in the realm of natural sound, in the realm of natural understanding based on natural sight and natural sound. What he saw in his, with his natural eyes, what he heard with his natural ears, and what his brain put together based on what he saw and heard. The Lord brought him out from that. Unto what? Unto the Lord's understanding. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. He brought him out from the realm below unto the resurrection, to behold the resurrection, to behold the one who fills heaven and earth. Let me put it this way. The Lord brought Abram's, right here with this passage, brought Abram's heart unto where he had already in type brought Abram's soul in reality. Remember, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abram while he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. The God of glory is present. And God continues preparing the ground of the heart so that now the one who is present can be, can be made known to be present. And I'm not playing with words. I'm not playing with words. How can you know someone is present except you see their face? Except you see the person. All right, verse 7, or verse, verse 6, And he believed in the Lord. And he believed in the Lord. I love that. 
He believed based on seeing the resurrection, based on seeing the risen Christ. He believed. That's true believing, my brothers and sisters. That is believing in the form of faith. That's why it says, uh, and he counted it to him for righteousness, because it was faith. He beheld. Faith is seeing what cannot be seen by the natural eye. Remember, once again, the whole context of this the, if you read verse, uh, starting with verse 1 up to verse 5, basically the situation was Abram was looking around in the natural realm with his natural eyes, and the whole situation was, hmm, I do not have a son. I do not have an heir. So then, according to the laws of the land, this uh, Eliezer, my chief servant, he will be the heir of my inheritance. He was taking an assessment based on what he saw with his natural eyes, based on what he had heard with his natural ears, and he was processing it with his natural mind, natural brain, and coming to a conclusion. This is the way it is, Lord. And then the Lord, we all, we all know, says, no. This one shall not. He said, no, Abram. You have the whole situation. How shall I put it? Misjudged. You have an unrighteous judgment, Abram, because your judgment is based on what you see in the natural and what you've heard in the natural. Therefore, your judgment, your case, is an unrighteous one. And if the Lord be, you know, if he were like a type of a judge right there, he would say, throw the case out. There's no evidence. The Lord brings Abram's heart forth abroad. He brings him forth abroad. And he brought him forth abroad and says, now, behold, now, lift, basically lift up your eyes and behold the resurrection and have a true judgment in any given situation. And I love it. I love it. And it says, and Abram believed in the Lord. And he is a true eyewitness of the resurrection. All right. Now verse 7, because I know we're pretty much running out of time here. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Okay, there is reality. I am the Lord that brought thee out to give thee this land to inherit it. And once again, our soul is the inheritance of Christ the Son, who is the true heir. And yet, because also here, Abram being a man, God promised him an inheritance. The inheritance of our soul is the appearing of Christ in the soul. Remember? Remember how we read it? Get thee out from thy land, from thy kindred, and come unto a land that I will show thee. And the land that God desires to show, that purposed every single soul to show, is the land that is filled with His glory. This is our inheritance, my brothers and sisters. Our inheritance, if you will, is the very purpose for which our souls were created, the appearing of Christ. And I will say this, I will say this. When I was, at, when I was born again, I was not upset with God for birthing life in my soul. I was not upset. On the contrary, I was very thankful and I glorified God. Very thankful. Now, when God, in His tender mercy and ever abounding grace, reveals His Son in the soul, do you think that soul, that person, will be upset? I don't think so. No. No. Because there is salvation present, and now when God reveals His Son in the soul, there is the knowledge of the salvation that is present. 
and I was very thankful. When God made known his son in my soul, the very purpose for which all things work toward, the very purpose for which God created the soul. His very own son. We will be just as blind Bartimaeus. We will follow him, giving glory unto God. So there you have it. Genesis chapter 15, verse 7. And the Lord said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And then verse 5. And the Lord brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Behold the resurrection. Behold the one who fills heaven and earth. And this is all that the Lord does. This, this is all that he does. At the moment of new birth, our souls have been translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of the son of his love. And then from that moment onward, it is just a matter of our heart coming in understanding unto where our soul has already been brought by the Holy Spirit at the moment of new birth our heart coming in understanding and knowledge from the knowledge and understanding of man to the understanding and knowledge of God, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, his very own son. This is all there is, my brothers and sisters. This is all there is to know the one who is present in the midst. But to know the one who is present in the midst, we must behold the one who is present in the midst. And to behold the one who is present in the midst, God the Father must reveal him who is present. So that's really all I had on my heart to share. Like I said, it's, I mean, I, I've since, I think it was the, towards the end of last year, maybe mid, mid last, maybe summer last year, you know, when I came, when I came to this spot, especially this spot in Genesis 15, I, my prayers have, have been on and off since that time. Lord, I don't, want, I don't want my heart to dwell in this natural realm. I want my heart to dwell, listen, listen to the way I say this, where my life, who is Christ, is found. Just as you brought Abram forth abroad, my God, and revealed unto him the resurrection, your very own son that fills heaven and earth. So, Lord God, bring my heart forth abroad. Let it please you to reveal your son in me, my God. For this is the purpose for which my soul exists. So, may this be our prayer, my brothers and sisters. May this be our prayer. If it hasn't been our prayer, May it become our prayer. And as we continue on unto knowing the Lord, it will become our prayer. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll leave you for this class. The Lord bless you all. Uh, we'll see you in our next class. Amen? Amen.